Mark Heyman is uh, the head of the Foundational Health Center at the Cleveland Clinic, and he's got a new blog uh, called uh, The Doctor's Pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. And uh, he's also uh, partnering with another gentleman uh, on a, a podcast called The Broken Brain. And uh, I, I, you can find it pretty easily. It's either Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, YouTube. Uh, there are several different things. Uh, I, I would just strongly urge you. I, I like him because he thinks like I do, or I think like he does. Not, I'm not nearly as good as him. But, and, and, and I got a little joke, and I hope I don't offend, offend anybody, but uh, here's a joke. It says, an 80-year-old Bessie bursts into the recreation room at the retirement home, and she holds her clenched fist in the air and announces, anyone who gets what's in my hand can have sex with me tonight. <laughs> and this gentleman in the back back there, he said, an elephant? And she looks at her hand and says, close enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I was afraid it might not go over. But <laughs> so, <laughs> the most important health care decision you make is what you choose to put on the end of your fork. And actually, uh, it's attributed to a different person, but, but I believe it really started with uh, Mark Heyman who said that. This is a slide that I usually start my talk with. It talks about healthy soil, which involves healthy microbes in the soil, which produce healthy food, and all that healthy food helps produce healthy humans. And now we know that it also in, it impacts in a significant way gut microbes, and that makes, helps make us healthy. And then uh, going all, all the way back to the soil, every, the circle, every, if, if it's not the circle, it doesn't. Uh, then we have problems, and that's one of the reasons we have problems in the country because we haven't had a good circle of life in agriculture. For tonight, I want you to leave feeling glad that you took the time to come and listen to my preaching. I'm not an expert, I'm just trying to preach about some information that others who are experts have uh, expressed and I've read about, and everything I say tonight is gonna help you reduce your risks of developing dementia, and everybody's afraid of getting dementia, so, so pay attention. Uh, dementia is the most expensive disease in America. I just found this today and put this in, it's new. Uh, it's the first time I've had it. Uh, the National Institutes of Aging estimated that in 2010, we spent uh, 215 billion a year taking care of people with dementia. That's twice as much as heart disease. Heart disease is only 100 billion. And cancer is three times as much money for dementia as for cancer care, for all cancer care. That was 77 billion. You know, it's three times that for dementia. So, uh, and I, uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the study found that, and, and we, we've heard a lot about it's getting more common and, and more prevalent. But actually, the study was done uh, recently that showed between 2000 and 2012, uh, there was a 24% reduction in dementia among people over age 65, and uh, and that was a significant trend. And that's that sounds good. Uh, but one of the problems is that uh, we're living so long, it's just that we're, we're getting it later. The reasons uh, higher education uh, and higher income are associated with better chances of avoiding uh, or delaying dementia, and uh, that's, uh, you know, the, 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 the smarter we are, the more education we've got, the more money we have, the more aware and the, the more we can learn things from our health care providers and our reading and, and so forth and coming to hear me preach to help reduce our risk of developing dementia. This, uh, I added this slide uh, uh, last year. I saw the thing and I thought this is really applies to the way I feel. It says, uh, an old man walks along a beach and sees a young boy throwing something back into the water. As he approaches, he sees hundreds of starfish on the beach that have been washed up from the tide. The young boy's rushing around throwing the starfish back into the water one at a time. The old man asks him why he bothers. It's pointless. There are too many starfish to save them all. And as he flings the starfish deep into the water, the young boy replies, it mattered to that one. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope I get some starfish here tonight that listen to me. Um, keys to avoiding dementia. Eating a healthy diet, which uh, you'll see in a minute. The Mediterranean diet was just shown to be tops uh, in a big uh, national study, getting regular exercise about 30 minutes a day, getting eight hours of quality sleep regularly, uh, and it's not just eight hours of sleep, but it's quality sleep, maintaining good social relationships with others, regular meditation and a little daily red wine, and seeing your a physician for checkups and getting your immunizations and screening exams. We're going to cover five things. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you at the beginning, I'll tell you again at the end. 
Uh, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. That's the original theme for my talk when I started giving it about four years ago and it's evolved into a lot more, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of that. Magnesium, why it's important, why we've become deficient, and how you can correct it. Boron turns out to be a very similar story to magnesium, it's just different. And vitamin D, why this hormone is so important, how you can improve yours. And finally, the gut microbes. Uh, I just added this last year. Uh, it's a new frontier of human health, largely controlled by our diets. And uh, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people has been attributed to uh, Rodale, who uh, has Rodale Institute and started the Organic Gardening magazine. And he also, Prevention magazine, that's over 50 years old, I think it's 52 or 53 years old. Uh, he's been a pioneer trying to help us learn to be healthier. And probably a lot of uh, people that are well educated and, and have a good income are more likely to read things like this. He's, they also have a whole slew of other things. The Runner's uh, Magazine, Men's Health, Women's Health, all those health-related magazines all come from Rodale Institute and their press. The farmers of Asia, for 4,000 years, uh, they, they were into holistic living. They really paid attention to how God designed the world and how it was supposed to run in order to be uh, healthy and, and, and holistic. And uh, uh, a gentleman named Dr. King, who also went to Cornell, which is my alma mater, uh, he was really interested in sustainable soil fertility, and uh, in the early 1900s, he went over and spent five years in China, Japan, and Korea trying to learn how they were doing things so successfully. At that point in time, around 1900, in our country, it took 25 acres to grow enough food to feed a person for a year. In, uh, in Asia, they could feed a person for a year on a quarter of an acre. Uh, and. Uh, what he found was basically they knew about the circle of life. Everything that was involved in their life ended up going on the compost pile. And after the compost had worked for a while, it went back on the land. And he determined that the general trend was to put about four or five tons of compost per year back on the land, uh, which was their circle of life. And it included all the human waste, too. That's one of the, that's one of the gigs that we have in our countries. We take all of our human waste, instead of composting it and using it back on the soil to regenerate the soil to make our food healthy, we dig a hole and bury it. Uh, we might as well have a needle in our arm and have the blood trickling out. Uh, William Albrecht, he was really uh, a brilliant gentleman. Uh, he designed most of the tests we use today for analyzing nutrients in the soil, the soil tests. And he also used those same tests for analyzing food, you know, wheat, corn, tomatoes, squash. He would analyze the nutrients in the food and correlate that with the soil. And he even went one step further in something that they're really just becoming popular with today, but he was doing it back in the mid-1900s, and that's so, uh, plant tissue analysis for nutrients. He, he was predicting because he'd observed over his career that the soil was becoming depleted of micronutrients like magnesium and boron and so forth. And uh, he uh, made a prediction back then that because of what he was seeing with farm animals, what was happening with them and their health because of the food that was raised on the depleted soil going downhill, he said we're going to have an epidemic of diabetes, obesity, cancer, heart disease, mental illness, all these things because our soil is becoming depleted and our food's becoming depleted and, and our bodies are just not getting what they're supposed to get to be healthy. And he pretty much got severely criticized by the medical profession back then, and it pretty much drove him out of his uh, career. Uh, Rodale came along a little bit after Albrecht, but the, the, the real key was Dr. Walters down in Texas, who uh, uh, believed in sustainable farming and uh, started the US, Acres USA magazine, which I still get every month and, and read cover to cover. A lot of good stuff in that. Walters, uh, when he was starting out, found out that Albrecht up in uh, Missouri, uh, that Albrecht was up in Missouri and, and heard all the stuff that Albrecht had done and thought, this is the guy, I need to pick his brain and find out uh, what he's learned because I think it's important for sustainable farming. Uh, the, the, the university where Albrecht had retired from said, leave him alone, he's an old man, he's sick, he's just, just leave him alone. Uh, his family said the same thing, but Walters ignored him 
and drove all the way from Oklahoma up to Missouri to find Albrecht and talk with him. And uh, they didn't have the interstates back then, so a trip like that was uh, pretty difficult. And he was so enamored of what Albert w could tell him that he started going one day a week, driving all the way up from Texas up to Missouri to listen to Albrecht talk. And after several weeks of these weekly visits, he arrived one week and found all these boxes of papers all over Albrecht's house. And I said, what the heck is this? And Albrecht says, well, I'm, I'm going to be dead soon. I've got over 800 articles, papers, books, and so forth that I've created in my career. And I don't know what to do with them. I'm just going to give them to you. And Walters used them and, and categorized them and organized them and, and printed a bunch of books called the Albrecht Papers, fortunately. Uh, that's just our farm. I just got that repainted last week. Uh, the more I learn about soil nutrients and human health, the better I can understand how they're so interrelated, just like Albrecht. Albrecht, uh, back in the mid-1900s, there was one journal for agronomy and plant science for the, the country, and he was the editor-in-chief of that. And there was one journal for the whole country at that time for veterinary medicine and uh, uh, animal health, uh, uh, and he was the editor-in-chief of that. So he understood the soil and plants, and he understood animals and their physiology and their nutritional needs, and he'd spent his career studying both. And as, as many of you know, I started off wanting to be a farmer when I was a little boy, but I, I didn't have the money, and the story is that God told me one night if I was a general surgeon that I'd get a farm, so that's <laughs> the deal that I, I accepted, and he, he kept his end of the bargain. But uh, uh, so I've got a, a little bit of what Albrecht had. I, I have some uh, interest and in knowledge about agriculture and a lot about medicine. But uh, early American farmers, they forgot the knowledge they learned in the past centuries uh, in the 1700s, 1800s, after the farmers depleted the East Coast soil until crops wouldn't grow anymore. Then they went to the Midwest, where the soil's eight feet deep because they had. 60, 80 million buffalo, it depends on whose story you believe, whoever counted them, and then the prairie grass, and that whole thing took carbon dioxide out of the air and created a lot of organic matter for the soil. But as many of you may know, the soil on the East Coast got so depleted that the farms were just abandoned because they wouldn't grow anything anymore. Uh, now, the next thing is magnesium. It's a central atom of the chlorophyll molecule in plants. Photosynthesis is a process by which chlorophyll uses sunlight to convert carbon dioxide into carbo carbohydrates or sugars and oxygen, the basis for human survival. Uh, magnesium is to plants what iron is to animals and humans. It uh, uh, uses the sunlight to make these uh, sugars for the plants, and about a third of the sugars that the plants produce, this is a thing that I didn't know before I took my master gardening, the plants secrete about a third of all that into the soil out, out their roots to feed the soil microbes in exchange for important soil nutrients that the microbes supply to the plants. I, I talk about it sort of like us going to the grocery store. We go around with a grocery cart and our shopping list and fill our cart and then we go up to the cash register and we give them some cash or a credit card to pay for the food. Well, that's sort of the same thing going on in the ground between the roots of the plant and the microbes. Uh, now. Everybody knows the Twilight Zone. Everybody watched it when you were younger. And you know the, you know the theme song. And that's the, what I get every time I look at this. There's the hemoglobin molecule with the iron in the middle and the plant chlorophyll with the magnesium in the middle. And if you, the hair doesn't go up on the back of your neck when you look at that and think about how similar they are between plants and chlorophyll and animals and hemoglobin. That, that is, uh, the gentleman who gave me this used to run the Rodale Institute uh, property and, and all the research. He was in charge of all that. He had to quit his job because he had a bunch of health issues and heart problems. After many years and lots of doctors, they found out it was because he was magnesium deficient. <laughs> and uh, actually, he's now writing a book on boron deficiency, and he lives in Hawaii. But he and I communicate. But he shared this slide with me, and I, I, I said, I got to use it. Uh, According to the National Institutes of Health, it's needed for about 300 biochemical reactions in our body. It serves similar functions in plants, about 300 different things that, in plants that need magnesium. Helps maintain normal muscle and nerve function, keeps the heart rhythm steady, supports a healthy immune system, and keeps our bones strong. Uh, 
considered by many to be the miracle mineral because it aids so many critical functions in our body and helps protect us from many common illnesses. Heart health, high blood pressure, vascular disease, diabetes, asthma, cancer, dementia, depression, mental illness, osteoporosis, fibromyalgia, PMS, migraines, headaches, strokes. So why are we now so deficient in magnesium? Unfortunately, our agricultural soils have systematically become depleted, uh, and that was, again, documented by William Albrecht back in the 1940s. Uh, our failure to replace magnesium loss from crop harvesting, so crops now contain less magnesium. One of the problems is magnesium doesn't have anything to do with crop yield. A farmer can skip adding magnesium, he still gets his 100 bushels of corn per acre. Uh, putting magnesium on doesn't increase that, it just increases the magnesium in the corn. Until we get smart and demand that the food have magnesium in it, th or that we pay the farmer based on the nutritional value or the nutrient density of the food, uh, they get paid by the bushel, not by the nutrient contents. So, and so there's no reason for them to spend money adding magnesium when it doesn't give them anything. They want return on investment. If they're going to spend a dollar, they'd like to get two or three dollars back, and that doesn't happen with magnesium. Uh, also, the diets that we eat contain insufficient magnesium. This is 10 or 15 years old, and I tried to find a newer one, but I can't. But th this basically tells the story. Uh, when this was done some years ago, this is the U.S. intake of magnesium versus what the recommended daily allowance is. And 75% of Americans were taking in less in their diet than they needed. Only 25% had adequate magnesium in the food that they were eating. Uh, but even those 25% who got adequate amounts in their diet, soft drinks, they bind the magnesium, keep it from being absorbed. Medications like diuretics, H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, two of the biggest, the three of the biggest things that people take, they all cause problems with absorbing magnesium from the gut. In the developed world, magnesium deficiency is the most common nutritional deficiency, but we can't test for it. You can do a blood test for it, but it's 98% inside the cells that your body goes to great lengths to keep the blood levels of magnesium normal uh, while the cells become depleted. So a blood test is a waste of time and money. Relationship between low magnesium and diabetes has been well established. The individuals with diabetes almost all have very low magnesium and low magnesium diets, are, they are more likely to develop diabetes. Uh, and uh, uh, the, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of teaching when you go to dietitians or doctors or clinics for diabetes instruction. They don't even talk about magnesium. Uh, doctors only get a couple hours of nutritional training out of 10 years of training. Uh, they're, they're not taught, and, and, and this was recognized back in the 80s, and it got a little bit better for a while, and then they checked it again in the late 90s, and it actually gotten worse than it was in the 80s uh, in terms of how much time is spent uh, with nutritional training for physicians. They mainly are taught to figure out what's wrong with you and try and help you get better. They're not, unfortunately, except for limited ex things like screening studies, they're not really educated and, and trained to keep you healthy, because if, if you're healthy, <laughs> you don't make any money. Same with the hospital. <laughs> How magnesium connects with insulin resistance and diabetes. Uh, this is a link from an article from 2009. It's a nice study. It talks about all the biochemistry involved with magnesium and production of insulin. Uh, this is a graph. Again, this only goes to 2009, and I can find some on the internet that go to 2012, none to 2016. But when I look at the numbers, uh, basically, it everybody knows when you were kids, when we were kids, Diabetes was rare. Less than 1% of the public had diabetes when we were kids. And, and over time, as the magnesium problem has, has gotten worse in the soil and in our food and in our diets, and we've had more deficiency in our bodies, the diabetes has just gotten more and more common. And actually, it's now like 30%. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's happening, and, and you can say, well, is this, is this really related to magnesium? But we know magnesium got, deficiency has gotten worse, and we know the diabetes has gotten worse. And 
they've, they've shown the article how biochemically it's all related, and yet the medical profession tends to keep ignoring it, unfortunately. The Mediterranean diet provides many benefits, uh, significantly reduces the risk for diabetes, helps with weight loss, uh, helps with cardiovascular health, lower blood pressure, decreased stroke risk. Uh, as I was listening to the blog last week, they had uh, someone talking about uh, nutrition and they talked about diets, uh, and they talk a lot about the Mediterranean diet, and there was a, a report, whoops, where'd it go, there we go. US News and World Report, this is from January of this year. They looked at 40 diets, and they had a bunch of experts analyze all these diets. And best overall diet, Mediterranean diet. Best plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet. Best diet for uh, healthy eating, Mediterranean diet. Easiest diet to follow, Mediterranean diet. Best diet for diabetes, Mediterranean diet. Best heart healthy diet, DASH, followed by the Mediterranean diet. Um, so that's kind of vindicates and, and, and reinforces what I've been preaching the last four years about diets. Foods in the Mediterranean diet, they're rich in magnesium. Eating a magnesium rich diet is important in fighting against the metabolic syndrome and according to a new study uh, funded by the National Heart, Lung and, and Blood Institute, uh, more magnesium may lower death, death risk. There's a Spanish researchers uh, did a five year study with people that were at high risk for heart disease uh, they found that those with the highest average intakes of magnesium were 59% lower risk of cardiovascular disease compared with those with the lowest uh, amount of magnesium in their diet, 37% reduction in cancer mortality, 34% in all-cause mortality. Uh, their conclusion was that dietary magnesium intakes inversely associated with mortality risk. The more you eat, the less likely you are to die. Uh, Magnesium and mental health. Uh, the, uh, it's intimately connected to neurological disorders due to critical roles with neurotransmitter production, uh, energy production, the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. Magnesium shortage can cause serotonin deficiency, and that's associated with depression, uh, suicide, irrational violence. Uh, in 2002, 16 years ago, the National Institutes of Health officially listed depression is a sign of magnesium deficiency. Uh, you watch TV, you, they talk about all these antidepressants. The fact is something like a third of us have serious depression and they have all these drugs and if you listen to the ads, they spend most of the ad talking about all the side effects and, and so forth. And, and the, the fact, and, and, and now they're actually coming out with a second drug that you take with the first drug to try and make the, sec the first drug effective and, and then again, they list the same terrible side effects. And the fact is, number one, they're very expensive. Number two, they don't work. Uh, and number three, they have terrible side effects. And once you get on them, you can't get off of them. I mean, it, it basically takes a court order in, in, in a year to get off of some of these medications because the side effects from withdrawal are so severe. Uh, what's the takeaway about magnesium? You want to increase it in your diet, i.e. the Mediterranean diet. Magnesium is better absorbed through our skin than our gut, uh, so doing things like magnesium oil or uh, Epsom salt soaks are a smart thing and reasonable thing to do. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of information about some of these things on the handout that uh, they made for you. Boron, it's uh, really, to a large extent, a repetition of what we heard about the, uh, the magnesium, but it's uh, also related to activation of vitamin D. People that were placed on the boron supplements were found to have, uh, after a period of time, their vitamin D levels came up and actually their estrogen and testosterone levels came up. Uh, one of the reasons, they, they've taken the testosterone, the, the T ads off of TV because of a lot of side effects and problems, but the fact is that a lot of older gentlemen have low testosterone levels and that's associated with some health issues. <coughs> Uh, health issues and longevity and uh, so there is a benefit for having higher testosterone levels but you can probably get a higher level by just taking some boron according to the studies. In 1923 they found it's an uh, essential nutrient for plants in the soil. Uh, it's one of the more common plant deficiencies uh, for nutrients and if the soil's low then the food that's grown on those soils is low. Uh, 
58 years later, in 1981, they showed that it was important essential mineral for growing baby chicks. Uh, and then in 1990, two, nine more years after that, they finally realized that it was an essential nutrient for humans, 67 years from the time that they realized it was important for plants. Uh, there's a Joan Collins song, uh, you don't know what you got till it's gone. They pay paradise and put up a parking lot. Well, it, it's basically, you know, the, the soil becomes deficient and the plants have trouble. And then later on, as the plants get sicker, then the animals get sicker. And then finally somebody connects it out and says, well, golly, the humans are having a problem as well. Boron and prostate cancer. Uh, the, uh, I've had a couple of prostate patients that were in advanced stages that, that took this. And, and they found uh, that their, their uh, prostate cancer shrunk, their PSAs went way down. Um, the uh, one was a good friend who's from CCNC. He had a dramatic response to just adding uh, boron, and they, they didn't think there was anything they could do for him. And he initially sounded like death warmed over, but he took the boron. The doctor said it was okay; didn't think it would hurt him. <laughs> and and he said his PSA came way down, his urinary tract bleeding stopped, his pain went away, and he began feeling healthy and normal again, just with taking some boron. More recent studies show higher intakes of boron associated with reduced rates of cervical cancer in females that uh, correlated significantly with lower rates of lung cancer as well. Uh, I told some of the folks that this is my garden soil test from last year. I've had this garden in the same place now for 24 years. And uh, I've got everything pretty much optimized. The yellow line that's not quite up to the optimal uh, area is magnesium and that's despite my putting a lot of magnesium sulfate or, or Epsom salt on my garden, uh, but I'm about, I do the soil testing every August, so I'm getting ready to do it again. And hopefully this year it'll finally have the magnesium up there too. But one of the things, they're starting to do this now in Australia and New Zealand. They're always way ahead of us and then it goes to California and then kind of spreads across our country. Is things with uh, organic farming and, and, and organic certification, <coughs> A lot of organic farmers in our country don't even do soil testing. They're now requiring that the people, in order to be certified organic in New Zealand and Australia, they have to be doing soil testing. They have to document if they got deficiencies. They have to document that they're correcting the deficiencies. What I say is they should require the farmers at the farmer's market to put a soil test like this above their vegetable stands and you go around and you look for a farmer who's got a vegetable stand who's got everything in the optimal range. And that's where you want to buy your food because that's food's going to have the highest nutrient density and that's what you want to have to be healthy. Vitamin D, uh, D3 is the active form. At first became available in 1974 just as I was getting ready to do a lecture on calcium metabolism for an uh, endocrinology program I was involved in at the time. Uh, this is from a year ago. I used it. It came out just before I gave a talk. Uh, March every year is National Nutrition Month, and for the last four years I've given a talk at the Fitness Center on Nutrition Month, and I uh, used this uh, a year ago. I've, I've talked again this year too, but uh, you can't see it. it uh, consider extra, these are great ways to live longer. And the number one is to consider extra vitamin D. Uh, and there were 50 things they listed, but that was number one on their list. This is AARP. A couple of you qualify for that. Uh, researchers found that vitamin D deficiency was linked to all-cause mortality. People with the lowest levels in their blood of vitamin D had a 26% increased risk of death during the study period compared to the people with the highest levels of vitamin D. <coughs> so clearly we want to keep our vitamin D uh, in the optimal range, which the doctor will tell you if it gets up to 30, you're okay. But more and more studies are coming out. I used to say 40 to 60. But now they're saying for breast cancer and colon cancer, you probably want to be in the 60 to 80 range. And more and more they're saying it needs to be above 50. Uh, they talk about 30 to 100 being the normal range for the lab. Uh, and the doctors, if it gets up to 30, they're tickled to death. But if you want to be healthy, you need to know what your doctor uh, got the, on his report. You need to ask him to do it. I've had several friends recently that just went to the doctor and, and they know about vitamin D and they're taking some vitamin D and they just assumed that the doctor would order a vitamin D test and they said, he didn't order it. And he said, well, 
we'll get it next year. You know, it's a, it, it, there, there are some doctors that are really tuned into the importance of vitamin D, but there's some aren't. Um, there was recently a Yale and Harvard are always in competition, whether it's academics or medicine or football or basketball, but uh, they're two Ivy League schools, and somebody challenged them to do a report on vitamin D, and it came out earlier this year. And the Harvard study basically rubber stamped all the things that I'm telling you about vitamin D, about how important it is and how all these different studies and so forth are showing how it benefits the public and how you need to keep your levels up. And for some reason or other, and I don't know why, but the, the Yale report was that it's all a big it's fake news. <laughs> but honest, you can look it up. You can Google it and, and, and look at Yale study on vitamin D, Harvard study on vitamin D, and they're black and white. Human calcium relationships, when your vitamin D is below 30, calcium is not absorbed from your gut. When blood, blood calcium levels get low, it triggers your parathyroid gland to increase the PTH production that sucks the calcium. In order to keep the calcium level up in your blood, where's your calcium in your, in, in your body? It's in your bones, so it sucks the calcium out of your bones to keep it up in the blood, and then your bone, bones turn to rubber and mush. Uh, and uh, if your low vitamin D persists and it's not corrected, then you get hyperparathyroidism and severe osteoporosis and severe bone pain. This is a, there, you can go to a lot of different countries in Europe that do national health insurance, single payer. Uh, they, th this one happens to be from Scotland. There's a similar one from uh, Norway that uh, I've got, but I only needed to put one because they all show the same thing. Basically, the black is deficient blood tests. They have all the blood tests for a year for the, all the people from their country for vitamin D. And vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin. In the summertime, you get some vitamin D produced because of being out in the sun. So the white bars are higher at the end of the summer, August, September, and the black bars are highest at the end of the winter, January, March, February, March. And uh, that's just the way it goes. And the two red dots are the two times of the year that I recommend you need to get your vitamin D checked. Late winter, February, March, late summer, August, September. Uh, that's when it's going to be peaked and when it's going to be the bottom. And you need to take uh, two, to th two or 3,000 more per day from September to April to keep your level up. When your vitamin D level falls down, then you're more prone to respiratory illness, the flu, pneumonia. And, and w if you look at the records, that's exactly what's happened. When the vitamin D is low, that's when everybody's sick in the hospital and dying. Uh, most people with D deficient require an extra, again, two to three thousand during, during the short day months, so September through March or April. Uh, but I, I strongly urge you to get your blood tested, not just to take it blindly. Uh, and you need to monitor your reports and keep track of what you're taking because it changes from year to year. Uh, and you need to have a good source of vitamin D3. You need to take D3, the active form. Uh, what should my level be? Uh, again, the doctor's happy if it's 32, but if, if I were you, I, I would be happy if it was above 50. There, there are 16 different cancers in autoimmune diseases like multi multiple uh, sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, just to name a few, that are much more common in people with low vitamin D. Those people with those illnesses, I mean, they just reported a few weeks ago about colon cancer and vitamin D, and if you go to the Susan B. Coleman uh, website for breast cancer. She just did a really nice, extensive, comprehensive report on vitamin D and breast cancer. Uh, you need to read it and be aware of it. Why is it important? Bone health, uh, absorption of calcium, uh, linked to high blood pressure, insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity. Uh, it helps reduce your inflammation. Inflammation is what makes you sick uh, and causes uh, everything to be worse. Uh, Depression, massive body of scientific research shows that vitamin D levels uh, are involved with serotonin production. So both magnesium, boron, vitamin D, they're all related to serotonin production. And because they're all low, we're having, basically, the studies tend to suggest we're taking, we're having about three times as many people with mental illness and depression now as we had a generation or two ago. Uh, that, that's what they're documenting. And, and they're not sure why but I have a pretty good idea. Uh, suggestion from my experience, if your doctor finds your vitamin D levels low, get the actual number. 
and you need to take two to five thousand units a day, probably five of the D3. <coughs> a number of the doctors get you on fifty thousand units a week of D2. Uh, I, I'm finding over and over again that uh, they do that, and then they don't have you. You should come back six or eight weeks after you start the vitamin D replacement and have another blood test to find out if you've gotten up to the optimal range or not. But most doctors never order that. And then I've had a number of patients that have taken their prescription from the doctor, the 50,000, once a week, and after they took all the pills and their prescription ran out, they asked the doctor, don't I get a refill? And most of them are told, no, nah, you, you, you took your medicine, you're okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but I would shoot for a range in the 40 to 80. I would try and keep mine above 50 and, and doing it twice a year and taking more during the winter. That's a simple thing you can do. It's not rocket science, and it's your health and your body and your life, and if it's a simple thing to do, just take the bull by the horns and take responsibility. The latest thing is gut uh, microbes and uh, their role in our overall health. Uh, this is really just in the last few years. We've known that soil microbes are important for plant health, and actually in the 19, early 1900s, uh, there was some studies showing that it was important for our immune system, the, the gut microbes for humans. And actually, I gave a talk on how it was related to colon cancer back in the 1960s. Well, I gave my talk in the 70s for a study that was done in the 60s that looked at diet and uh, gut microbes and carcinogens and colon cancer risk. We're now opening an amazing informative window about how gut microbes are tied to almost all human diseases uh, we've learned that there are about 400 trillion microbes in our body. It's about the same number of microbes as there are cells in our body, 400 trillion, one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship practically. While they're mostly bacteria, there's also fungi and viruses and protozoa. Modern hygiene, uh, our thing for cleanliness and washing everything and sterility and uh, Lysol and alcohol and trying to kill all the bugs and using antiseptic soaps and so forth has really hurt us more than it's helped us. It's, it's killed off the good bugs and it's allowed a lot of the issues with hospitals and super infections and super bugs are because of overuse of antibiotics, but it, they're, they're, it's similar relationship and problem. Uh, our habits are hurting us. Uh, the studies show that tribes in remote areas of the world uh, with more diverse microbes in their gut, uh, they, have, they live longer, less health problems, our modern hygiene are, are really making us uh, unhealthy. Eli uh, Miknikov uh, was a Russian scientist who worked with Louis Pasteur, and uh, he was really sort of the father of uh, uh, probiotics, uh, and uh, he uh, won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1908 for helping the, uh, pioneer the issue of cell how cellular and humoral immunology were all tied to gut microbes. Studying around 2005, there are significant microbe populations between individuals. Uh, they looked at people with different health problems and they looked at their stool microbes and they saw certain patterns uh, that were correlated with things like obesity, diabetes, arthritis, and they finally got it defined well enough so that they could take a stool sample from somebody they didn't know. They, they, the lab was just given the stool sample. They said, what can you tell us about this person that came from? And they look at the, the microbe distribution and they'd be able to tell you, this person's probably diabetic, you're probably obese, uh, whatever, be, be based on the microbes in their gut. And they're usually right. According to a new CDC report, only one in 10 Americans eats the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables each day. And that's sort of the backbone of the Mediterranean diet is fruits and vegetables. Uh, they, they've shown that if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, or if you follow the Mediterranean diet, which is another way to say the same thing, that uh, you're going to have uh, improved health, you prevent diseases like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. Uh, <clears throat> here's an interesting thing. Mother's milk. Human mother's milk produces a number of complex sugars some of which are totally unable to be digested by the baby. So you'd say, why did God design this milk from a mother's breast when the baby can't eat it? But those sugars go through the baby's stomach down into the GI tract, and they help stimulate 
the population of some microbes that uh, in turn produce immunoprotective and anti-inflammatory substances that benefit the baby. Uh, the gut microbes in breastfed babies are significantly different than formula fed and of course the babies that are breastfed are much healthier. Diabetes, again, they, they did a bunch of analyses and they were able to tell from looking at the stool sample whether the person that gave the stool sample was non-diabetic, pre-diabetic, or diabetic based on the bug mixture in their colon. We already know that earlier discussion that diet greatly influences the risk of becoming a diabetic. In the Mediterranean diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and rich in boron and magnesium is a prime example of one that's proven to, be, to greatly reduce one's risk for becoming diabetic. So I decided that I was going to, uh, last year when I was redoing this slide for, I give this, I've given it like 30 or 40 times now over the last four years, and I was getting ready to give it again, I decided I would Google Mediterranean diet and gut microbes. And I wasn't surprised to find that in the last few years, there's been a lot of documenting studies to show just what you'd expect. Uh, the Mediterranean diet and health, food effects on gut microbiota and disease control. There's several articles, you know, from 2014, 2015, 20, 2009, 2014. This one down here at the bottom, I'll read it. You probably can't. The way to a man's heart is through his gut and microbiota dietary pro and prebiotics for the management of cardiovascular risk. One of the things they did in, in the first article they took, it seems like it was like 40 typical Americans that volunteered for the study and uh, eating the typical American diet and they got stool samples and analyzed the stool samples and they found a bunch of bad bugs in there. And one of the premises for joining the study was that they would agree to follow the Mediterranean diet for two months and then they had their stool tested again. And after two months following the Mediterranean diet, uh, they found that the bad bugs were gone and all the good bugs that are associated with healthy people uh, had occurred. You, know, you build it and they'll come. Uh, it, the right food, um, you, they, they sell pills with these little uh, probiotics in them and, and you can have yogurts and so forth. The fact is the normal human stomach with its high acid levels kills most of those bugs. They never get past the pylorus into the bowel. But uh, uh, if you put the right food in the gut, like the the mother's milk for the baby, if you put those sugars in there that pass through the baby's stomach into her colon, the bugs just come. I, I don't know where they come from, but uh, uh, and it's the same thing with uh, adults following the Mediterranean diet. You, the reason it makes you healthy is because when you follow it, you get good microbes in your gut and the bad ones disappear. It's not rocket science. Uh, but it's new. It's fairly new. And, and there again, there's only a handful of doctors that are really up on this. Neurology and psychology, one of the most interesting findings has been the role of microbes in mental health and uh, neurologic conditions. Uh, they can communicate with the brain and the central nervous system by making neurotransmitters that get transmitted by the vagus nerve to the central nervous system. Certain gut changes appear to be associated with autism spectrum disorders, perhaps bipolar disorder, major depression, even schizophrenia may be affected by gut microbes, which are affected by your diet. Uh, evaluating the relationships between diet and gut microbes, we discover some interesting connections and relationships, findings and associations help us better understand how eating a healthy diet actually results in chemical changes wrought by gut bacteria changes that either keep us healthy or make us sick, depends on whether we eat good food or bad food. Um, again, going back to the most important decision is what you put on the end of your fork. And I'm predicting that uh, vitamin D, magnesium, and boron, when we get a little further along, they're going to be shown to be very important for getting the good microbes to grow in your gut. So the circle of life continues. A healthy soil, healthy microbes, healthy farming, uh, and avoiding toxic chemicals, they are related to production of healthy food. We're discovering that consuming healthy foods in the proper types and mixtures can hugely impact the type of bacteria growing in our gut and that they can help prevent our diseases. Uh, and you can ignore all these correlations at your own risk. Uh, a lot of the medical community is still saying scientific studies haven't really been done on large groups over long periods of time to prove these things. But that's because there's no funding. The, the government's not going to fund it. I mean, they keep cutting funding for anything that's decent. And the drug companies aren't going to fund it. They're funding studies for their drugs that poison you and don't work uh, and, and, and cost a bunch of money. And, but actually, there's a, a group 
uh, uh, a, the health group that's taking donations from the public that's doing some of these long-term large studies now on their own. It's just, it's, it's public driven by people like you and me who are interested in finding the truth. But the fact is, we kind of know what the truth is. We see these trends and these correlations over and over and over again over the last several decades. And you can either ignore them or, or you can believe them. It's sort of like, you know, if you're smart, you're going to wear your seatbelt. We know that wearing a seatbelt helps make it more likely you'll survive an auto accident. If you take these nutrients, you're more likely to stay healthy and not get dementia and so forth. We, we pay the doctors to make us better when we should be paying the farmers to keep us healthy. Okay. And there, here we go, let's make our bodies great again. <laughs> Uh, you want, th this is all on your handout. Uh, you know, the Mediterranean diet, uh, uh, exercise, sleep, uh, the magnesium, the vitamin D, uh, the boron. Uh, all these things are important for your overall health. Um, but the one probably we care about the most is dementia. Some pictures of some of the bottles. Uh, and uh, this is just my farm. Uh, the, my PowerPoint. Actually, it's an older one. I haven't got this version I just made today. I threw out a lot of old slides and put in a bunch of new slides. But there's also on there a long bibliography that uh, has articles and, and, and studies that document and back up the things that I've said in my slides. And they're with hyperlinks. And if you go to this big, long bibliography and click on the article that seems to apply to what you'd like to know more about, it'll take you to the full article with a hyperlink on your computer so you can read to your heart's content about uh, the proof of the things that I've said. Now, I'm, I'm retired 11 years. I'm not a licensed doctor, and I'm not giving you any medical advice. I'm just giving you some suggestions that I think will benefit you and make you healthier. And thanks for coming, and I hope you all learned something.